First of all, hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Tracy and others for, um, for having me here. This is a great honor and I really look forward to um, interacting with everyone at the workshop. So my name is Dr. Anita Bandrovsky. I lead the RRID initiative and I will introduce that in a second. Um, I'm also at the Department of Neuroscience um, at UCSD. Um, thanks to Tracy and others uh, at the Charité, I've been visiting professor there um, and that ends at the end of the year, but it's part of the workshop. Um, and of course I have, as Tracy mentioned, I have a conflict of interest um, to declare I am the founder and CEO of uh, SciCrunch Inc., which is a company that is uh, devoted to uh, working with publishers primarily um, to improve the scientific literature. So um, uh, what are RRIDs first and foremost? Um, so these are persistent unique identifiers for things that scientists use. It's for the stuff that goes into the uh, paper itself. So these things were created jointly by the National Institutes of Health, a bunch of journal editors, um, UCSD and other researchers. Um, so this is not you know, created out of my head, it is created as a, as a joint project among a lot of different people. Um, our lab happened to be uh, the lab that actually implemented um, the uh, joint uh, you know, uh, uh, guidelines. Um, these actually function to support the National Institutes of Health guidelines for rigor and transparency. Uh, they are for things called key biological uh, resources, which is part one of the uh, guidelines uh, specifically called out in all grants from 2016 forward. Um, these were funded and uh, uh, maintained jointly by a lot of the following projects, the Neuroscience Information Framework, which I don't speak to about, a lot about anymore, but that is where they came from, uh, DKNet, uh, SciCrunch itself uh, through various contracts, uh, and uh, the Helmsley Charitable Trust. And uh, so there's a lot of funding, including now a uh, new award specifically for IRIDs. So what do these things uh, solve? Well, here is kind of the, the problem as we see it. Key biological resources are simply not findable. So if you look at this mouse, this Nod PK Skid IL2 uh, mouse that is um, referred to by these authors of this paper, whose names have not been included on this slide for various reasons that you might understand. Um, if you search for this uh, string or any part of it, you will either get no mice or you will get um, uh, uh, you will get multiple mice. And so that's a bad thing to do. And as meta researchers, you know that you know if you can't actually track this down, it means that um, you know this paper can't be reproduced just because you can't get the right uh, animal without talking to the author. So what you would do in this situation, if you wanted to reproduce this paper is you would email the author, which obviously takes a lot of time. Um, and the author would be able to tell you in many cases uh, what that mouse was. Of course, that varies with how long the paper has been out and what have you, which lots of meta researchers have shown. So our solution for this kind of problem was, hey, why don't you, author, just put the research resource identifier into the paper in the first place? And if you do that as, a, um, as an author, more than 90% um, of the resources in these papers are able to be identified. So we had published this. Um, we also noted that the cost of curation was uh, greatly removed or reduced. Um, one question uh, early on in this uh, in this uh, endeavor was to really ask how common it was uh, to not be able to find things like cells, organisms, or antibodies. And today we'll focus a lot on cell lines because um, this is an important uh, part of the um, of the whole picture. Um, but this is a very common thing throughout. Um, all different kinds of research resources, uh, including, uh, of course, um, uh, you know, various things like constructs, organisms, antibodies, and other things. 
And you might ask the question, and this is just here to give us a good anchor in terms of the scale and the scope of these things. Cell lines, how many cell lines are there out for people to use? And basically we have over a hundred thousand of these things. So this is, you know, when you were, as, as we're thinking about creation of tools and other things, you need to understand the scope of this entire problem. And the scope here for cell lines is 116 things. Um, and that's going to drive what kind of tools are able to um, be used. So our IDs, research resource identifiers, are conforming persistent identifiers that are served through regular identifier rules and the RRID colon in all identifiers tells um, listening bots what that what this thing is that it's um, that the author is trying to say. The authority is the next piece for cell lines. This is CVCL, which is um, Cellosaurus. That's the prefix for the Cellosaurus database from Switzerland. And then the local identifier at Cellosaurus or at the authority is the next piece of that identifier. So this is a perfectly conforming identifier and it's resolved by the RRID resolver. That's how you can read these things. Um, because you can read these things regularly, um, you can go into a paper, such as in this case, I went into cell metabolism and you can run a small robot uh, on this. This, uh, this robot was actually, it's called Cybot. It was written by our graduate student, Tom Gillespie, in about a weekend. Um, we've fixed it a lot since then, but the point is, is it was very easy to write. The reason it was so easy to write is because the robot simply um, reads a, a particular web page, usually an article, and uh, it looks for anything that says that is called RRID. This is a relatively unique string in the scientific literature. There's only one abbreviation outside of the RRID system that actually uh, is used, and that is renal risk in Derby. So we get false positives uh, in about uh, five to 10 papers per year. Um, the rest of the papers are, in fact, um, uh, um, able to be processed uh, automatically. So our IDs, um, the, the robot itself here um, that uh, Tom wrote is um, essentially a reader that picks up this um, as, a, as a signal and then takes this whole text until the end of it, either a uh, return character or a certain number of characters um, and submits it to uh, that resolver. And then it comes back with a packet of information, which is able to then be looked at by the curator um, as an, a hypothesis annotation. And I can, we can go into hypothesis. This is a really nice way to be able to, um, you know, highlight a piece of text uh, in, say, a paper and say something about it. In this case, the robot uh, reads this text and says uh, things that the database knows about this particular entity. One of the things it knows is that this came from ATCC, as you can see. Here is its catalog number, CRL2539. And here is its RRID. This is the proper citation. So um, the curator can verify that this is correct. And it can go through this process many, many times. Um, that actually serves one important piece of data that we'll, um, we'll need for the rest of this um, study. Now, it's not just identification that RRIDs are for, because in fact, when you look at the uh, Cellosaurus website or you look at the RRID website and you search for certain cell lines, um, there are quite a few of them that have been uh, noted to be problematic in some way. Uh, there's always an explanation. Uh, so in this case, this cell line is truly contaminated. It should not be used. Um, but there are many different kinds of notes that um, have been stuck to these different uh, cell lines. So you might ask, what are the sorts of things that could happen to this reagent? Um, well, reagents, in a sense, these are cells, right? So these are living entities. These living entities generally come from a donor person. This is um, 
you know, for example, a tumor that has been excised out of a living patient, um, that biopsy has been done, the cell line is formed, and that cell line uh, might have some problems, right? One of the problems is misidentification. Since these cell lines come from patients, we understand that patients can be misdiagnosed. And when patients are misdiagnosed, one of the things that can happen is when you remove that tumor, you're actually uh, attaching metadata to now that cell line, uh, which follows the cell line um, throughout its entire life cycle. And if that diagnosis is incorrect, then that metadata is also incorrect. Um, so there are places where um, there is misidentification. There's also things like uh, cross-contamination. So sometime during the lifetime of that particular cell line, if a different cell uh, comes into this colony, it might overgrow the original cell line and now become an entirely different things. Of course, there's also um, problems with instability of cell lines where um, there's selective growth and selective outgrowth. I won't really go into these. These are harder to check and more um, checking uh, in terms of biology. But these things here, cross-contamination and interchange, these are the kinds of things that we can definitely uh, track, not just on, um, uh, you know, not just in the lab, but also in the cell repositories. Okay, so, now we have a bunch of these warnings. And in fact, there are about a thousand warnings uh, for different kinds of cell lines out of a hundred thousand cell lines. So that's the scale of uh, all of this that we're working with. And we know that in order to put in an RRID, the author has to access one of these websites in order to um, you know, copy and paste this identifier into their paper. And we know that this warning is here. So now the question became, of course, does it change author behavior? And this was the, war uh, the question that my student, Jeliana, um, had asked. And so, um, you know, first we said, well, how many cells uh, are there on this problematic list? And there are about a thousand. So now, how can we tell if this author behavior has changed was the first question that I really asked Jeliana. Um, and the question really became then to try and define the baseline author behavior. So we first went to the literature and we asked the literature, okay, who has looked at this before? How have they looked at it? And what are the sorts of estimates that we can use? Because of course we know from our Cybot work, which is something that, um, several students do, including Shaliana did um, before this project and a bit after. But um, we wanted to know what to compare our numbers to. So previous estimates unfortunately focused on very small number of cell lines usually. Um, the estimates of the prevalence of the use of these cell lines varied absolutely widely. Uh, within the literature, none of the studies were truly definitive. And um, when the studies actually examined um, papers, they tended to examine a relatively small number of papers and with the goal of getting the journals to retract or um, have those papers amended. None of the studies really that were broader in scope actually did more than search the literature in several different ways. You'll learn about some of those ways of searching the literature. It's, it's okay to do it that way, but it's, it's not going to necessarily give you a definitive answer. So we started thinking about how to create a robot that could actually find all cell lines within a paper and all papers in general. So in terms of the inputs to the study, right, we knew that we had over a million open access papers in PubMed Central. 
Um, all of those were in JATS XML format, and this allows us to query for section information in addition to other things. So um, this is as simple as writing a quick XPath uh, statement in order to uh, take the paper and say, use the method section. Um, we also had all of the RRID data um, that we had been laboriously gathering for a different project. Cell line papers, um, uh, were not just open access, but also closed access. So our RRID literature, we knew had both open and closed records, but if we wanted to see a large corpus of, um, of data, we actually knew that we could get over a million papers, but only from the open access literature. Hence, was our first uh, kind of question. So um, here is where the students basically go through every single paper that has an RRID and pull out the RRID uh, entities, which include cell lines. And here was a big open access uh, set of data that we knew we could get access to, including the uh, section information. And that section information became very important because we really were not interested. So if you do a search in many, um, for many studies, one of the things you will search is everything in the paper. We really didn't wanna do that. We only wanted to search for papers that had used a particular cell line as opposed to discussing a particular cell line. So the discuss discussion, um, entities really uh, inclu are included in the introduction in the discussion section. But we really wanted to focus only on the methods because that is where people say, I used this cell line, I used this antibody, I used this chemical in order to do this procedure. So we wanted to focus in on the section of the paper, which uh, thankfully JATS allowed us to do, um, that people generally describe what it is that they're using. So considerations, right, for this tool, open access versus all papers, is that going to make a difference for our study? Um, the RRID papers were also suggested to simply be better papers because this was um, a relatively rare occurrence in 2019. Um, because it was relatively rare, it was only the kind of um, papers that generally were um, from authors who truly cared about uh, openness and reproducibility. Were these in fact better papers? Um, we had to consider that. Uh, and then the tool type became very important. So we knew we wanted to process a million papers. Um, reg uh, regular expression was the easiest um, thing to get online. So a regular expression is similar to, to Cybot. We were certainly able to create that. Um, neural nets were another, um, were another option that we um, had uh, some experience with. And then of course, named entity recognition uh, type tools uh, were another um, option. A, a final option, which we also considered, but only much, much later were uh, the large language models. Um, and so first we looked at regular expression. We absolutely were not going to be able to use that um, because there were simply too many. If you look at the scale of the problem, the reason that regular expressions work really well with RIDs is because it's really only looking for the words, for the letters RRID colon or RRID space. It can take some of those vari variants, um, uh, variances around that particular string, but if it does not see that string or or a set of string that it's it's um, uh, um, expecting, then it will not get uh, that particular annotation. But because there are so many different ways to talk about cell lines, in addition to there being 100,000 plus cell lines, regular expression was not going to be something that would be useful in this case, which uh, left us with either neural nets or named entity recognition. Um, we also knew that we wanted to uh, validate a lot of results. Um, once we got into uh, neural nets versus named entity recognition, we actually um, first did a, a set of uh, tests 
and I'll show you what some of those look like. Um, so in terms of um, open access, we knew that we would like to use both open and closed access mm -hmm. literature, but in fact, the open access um, was the only practical way to get a large uh, sample. Um, and we had to deal statistically, only statistically, uh, asking whether the RID papers were in fact better. We have a better way to do that now, but at the time we really did not. Um, and I'll show you how, uh, well, we, we chose named entity recognition as opposed to neural nets because our initial testing with neural nets um, was not very good. Uh, and, and it didn't solve the problem of trying to find the sentences and the cell lines within the sentences. So we actually chose named entity recognition as our tool. Um, and in terms of manual validation of results, we knew that we wanted to get um, uh, a lot of these things validated. We thought we would get about a thousand papers that we could reasonably validate. We knew that most of them would not have cell lines because um, cell lines are not uh, used in every paper. They were used in about, um, we thought at the time around 10% of papers. So we thought we wanted to have at least a hundred good examples to test against. And so um, uh, my student Jeliana actually chose to verify every 65th uh, paper out of um, uh, a large set, which basically was the way that she um, uh, validated. So we validated um, this um, by not really using proper randomization, which as um, later uh, I had later um, become aware of. So, um, okay. So how do we, how do we train a named entity recognition tool? So we looked at 1,457 cell lines. Um, these were annotated by one of two human curators, um, and there were um, about 300, I believe, uh, papers which were um, uh, which were actually uh, accessed by both curators. And uh, the agreement of the curators was well over 90%. So we knew that this was a task that could be done by two independent people relatively consistently, which was one of the reasons that we knew that the robot could then be trained to do this. Um, so just for demonstration purposes, we, um, I'm showing you two sentences here. Um, with the annotations included. So um, in this sentence, there are two cell lines that were pulled out by both curators. And in this sentence, there were two cell lines that were, that were pulled out by both curators. And um, when you feed these things into the tool, um, the tool will um, take these sentences, look at the annotations for these, and then um, do a lot of processing. So um, the raw named entity recognition will simply look at these sentences with these entities. Um, but what we needed to do um, to improve our performance was to actually take the sentences, parse uh, the parts of speech of each sentence. We um, uh, did a, a full set of sentence diagrams for each of these. And then we um, omitted, in order to train, we omitted um, the actual text of uh, the annotations in order to um, train the tool not on specific words, um, but on the sentence structure that we wanted. Okay, so how did we do? Um, what we did is out of those 1,450 some odd uh, sentences, we took 90% of those and we used that 90% for training and we left the other 10% for testing. Now that 10% was never seen by the tool beforehand so we could get a good sense of how the tool was doing on novel data. We actually did this 10 times in order to get averages for uh, precision and recall and overall, uh, overall F1 uh, means. So we did 10 rounds of uh, training. Now with the large language models, that's not really possible to do at this point. Um, it would be far too expensive. Um, I'm not sure if you realize how much it costs to do a full uh, training run 
on uh, one of these large language models, but in um, the, the most recent version of chat GPT was over a hundred million just in, uh, in training time. So that was server time, not anything else. So a hundred million dollars is not what we had. Um, and these NAIR tools are far smaller. So um, they're able to be retrained multiple times for us to get um, this kind of uh, reasonable average precisions and recalls. And actually we um, saved one of these uh, trainings of the tool, um, which seemed to do the best and uh, we used it in the rest of the paper. So um, we voted to have, <laughs> voted, we, we tweaked the tool, we tuned the tool for precision. So the precision here is 87.3%, um, whereas the recall, it, recall is how many things did the tool find um, was actually a little bit lower, giving us an overall F1 score of uh, 72%. So um, that means that the tool is going to make um, about three mistakes out of 10, um, out of 10 total uh, annotations. So that is, and this is what those would look like. So for example, here in this sentence um, that the curators had marked up, when the tool runs on it, um, or when the tool ran on it, it actually got uh, two annotations correctly. And in this case, uh, it recognized this plasmid as a, um, as a uh, cell line, and that was not correct. And here in the second sentence, it recognized one of the cell lines correctly, um, but it actually failed to recognize this HeLa um, cell line as a, uh, as a cell line uh, also. So, um, and you can kind of see why um, when, uh, when you're actually not looking at the, the term itself, which is sort of the exact opposite of what you would be doing with a regular expression, um, what you are doing is you're actually just relying on the structure of the sentence. And so if the structure of the sentence is something that the tool hadn't seen before, then uh, it will not pick things up nearly as well um, as if you were just to say, okay, I'm just going to look for everything that says HeLa, right, in that particular, um, in that particular paper. And you know, these are both strategies that can be useful and they can do better under different circumstances. Um, again, we chose this was a choice. This was a conscious choice um, of what we did because of the size um, largely of the um, of the data set. OK, so in terms of this split, the algorithm was deployed on um, just shy of two million uh, open access records. Um, and we found that there were 305,000 um, unique cell line names from 150,000 papers. So uh, there were generally two mentions of each cell line in the paper. So if you actually look at these numbers, the recall doesn't kill us in this case, because if you um, have a 61% chance or 62% chance in this case, of finding a cell line mentioned once, and generally they're mentioned twice, this number actually gets bumped up quite a bit because it's 61% um, finding each of the mentions. So um, the actual recall is much higher when you look at the whole paper because we're only looking at did or did uh, did the authors or did the authors not mention this particular cell line. Whereas the false positives really do have to be dealt with in a different way. So um, those were, so these are the numbers. And so now we have uh, 305,000 uh, pieces of data. And these were um, sentences and entities within those sentences um, from this number of articles as our data set. So one of the first things we wanted to do, again, um, is we wanted to take a look at how those, um, uh, you know, how those data actually come back uh, in terms of um, how do they compare to what a human would be likely to find. <laughs> 
So um, Juliana did this by herself this time. She went through a thousand papers and um, these were, as I said, not completely randomly selected, which was a, a very um, serious problem. Well, it wasn't a very serious problem, but it was a problem with our study. Um, so, but she did check a thousand papers and she found no cell lines uh, with, uh, and also the tool found no cell lines in 815 of those papers. And both the curator and the robot found a cell line, at least one cell line in um, 138 of those uh, papers, which is overall a 95% agreement between the tool and um, the curator on this relatively loose criterion. Um, SciScore had um, 17 places which we considered false positives, although when looking back at it later, um, uh, Juliana had also made some mistakes. Uh, and the curator found 33 papers, which um, the tool did not find. So those are false negatives. And again, we're expecting more false negatives based on our previous training uh, than false positives. So this is relatively in line, but you'll notice there are problems here, right? The tool is not perfect. We would like the, um, you know, we would like the tool and the curator to be perfectly aligned, but that is not going to be the case um, with these kinds of, with these sizes of data sets and with these kind of tools. Um, so now we have 305,000 things to look at. Um, so we have 305,000 things. And so the question is, how do we answer our question based on um, that relatively large set of data that came out of the, um, out of the tool? And this is where we started doing some uh, fun magic for, of, of Excel. Um, we knew what the entities were. So for example, in our previous uh, case for these sentences, these were two cell lines. And now we wanted to, to ask the question, is this cell line or is this cell line on the problematic list? So we were able to download all of the names and the um, synonyms of everything on the problematic list. We put that into um, an Excel, um, Excel spreadsheet. And then we actually used the VLOOKUP function to determine whether anything in this column actually matched anything in this column. Fairly straightforward, a very simple function, but we weren't completely satisfied with that because these entities that were picked up by the tool, as you saw before, some of them were false, positives. And some of them, even when they weren't false positives or false negatives, the entities were not exactly the name that is being used in the database. With RRIDs, it was the number. The number was already looked up. We knew what that number was. Matches there were very simple. But what if somebody actually put in CF1 versus CF-1? Now, a human being would see these two things and say, ah, these are the same. And that would be the case, but it's not the case in Excel. It's not the case for a computer. So CF1 and CF-1 are actually not the same uh, cell line according to this very simple lookup. So what we did is we started playing with a lot of wildcard characters and um, we started to, um, effectively, again, you cannot look at, a, at 300,000 things manually. You could, but that's not the kind of money that I have for this project. So we needed to figure out basically in that large amount of data, what are some of the bounds? Because again, we couldn't look at these things one by one necessarily. Um, so we came up with a couple of things. There was a strict criterion, which is, does this text match a text on the problematic list exactly? And that was the strictest criterion. And then we had effectively put in um, wildcards around the problematic list and the entities to see what was contained within what. And that was a much looser criteria. And then we came upon um, a third criterion that we looked at, which was called the edit distance criterion. 
which uh, we basically removed all of the wild, all of these characters. We removed spaces so that CF1 and CF-1 would actually be, become the same thing. So that was the edit distance um, metric, which ended up being right in between the strict and the loose. Um, but of course, there would be things like this when the uh, tool recognized CF1 mouse embryonic fibroblasts as an entity, this would not be the same as CF1, even though in fact, that is, you know, that is actually the same. Um, but it got rid of things like CF10, CAF1, and other related entities. So we thought this was, um, while it still made mistakes, there were, um, they were minimized in a sense. So what did we find? Um, so what we found just in this plot is that first of all, 7% of open access papers actually do use cell lines. So 7.7%. .7%. So um, we were looking at a whole lot of papers um, overall. And in fact, when you look from 97 to um, 2018, this number just rises. Um, the percentage in terms of um, the matching to um, uh, contaminated or problematic cell lines on the loose criteria, which is uh, here in the purple, and um, on the uh, um, uh, strict criteria, which is here in the blue, um, you could see that there was about five to 10% roughly um, of the cell lines that were noted that actually had um, matched one of the problematic or contaminated cells. So this is not an insignificant problem. Right, this is absolutely not an insignificant problem, and because we were able to do this, this is actually the definitive paper that had mapped this kind of um, uh, this metric. Um, there is also another thing that um, I have to talk about. Um, this problematic cell line list was uh, published in a manuscript. And um, this problematic list is the uh, effort of many, many scientists, and it was great work that they had done. Um, the way that they distributed this is they wrote a paper about it, they put it on their website as an Excel sheet, um, and they asked authors and journals to actually look at that list when they were um, working with cell lines in order to. Um, get the um, the authors to pay more attention to this. And so we thought, hey, you know, these people have been screaming since 20, um, late 2012, early 2013 um, about this particular issue. Um, they have an international community. Did it make a difference? Um, and the answer here is that, you know, before 2012, the, um, you know, whether whichever you look at the, the loose criteria or the strict criteria, um, the absolute value of cell line, uh, cell lines that were uh, problematic in the post versus pre <clears throat> time period was higher. But if you look at the slope, the use of problematic cell lines continues to increase here up until 2012 but it starts to actually decrease um, after the ICLAC paper. So this is relatively good news because at least as a percentage, um, it seems that the authors are starting to do a little bit better. Um, it's not dramatic. It's definitely not dramatic, but they are starting to do a little bit better. So um, this paper was um, actually doing uh, the intended work that it was, uh, it was supposed to be doing. Um, we also looked across different journals in order to see what the percentage of, of uh, problematic cells were. And PLOS One is right in the middle. I mean, it's such a big journal that you basically get the average of all things. So here in the red, you see that these are, um, in fact, the cell lines themselves. So uh, this is now on the edit distance, which was that intermediate uh, metric. And this was 8.8%. .8%. But if you look at whether a problematic cell line was in the paper at all, in the paper at all, right? So remember there were two cell lines basically um, 
uh, usually used within it. So on average, there were two cell lines per paper that was using a cell line. Um, and so when you look at this, it almost doubles the percentage because generally people are using a, um, you know, two cell lines. And if one of those is contaminated, we count the, uh, the paper as, um, as potentially contaminated. So um, the percentage of papers that this affects is actually um, over 16%. And we were able to look at different journals. Um, and then we looked at uh, the problematic list. Now we could finally do our comparison with the RID papers. So in the absolute sense, the auto-detected cell lines here were at a um, uh, at 8.66% of the total uh, list. And this was um, uh, this was again the entirety of the literature. Um, now much more this is much more skewed towards the newer papers because there's so many more of them in the open access set. Um, but it certainly was the case. And then we looked at the total problematic or contaminated cell lines in the RID data set. And these were 3.3%. Uh, three, uh, now, I have mentioned that a lot of these are able to be used safely. Um, they simply were mislabeled, like that misdiagnosis um, example. So as long as you know what the true nature of the cell line is, you should be able to actually use these cell lines um, with the full knowledge that there was an event that was noted. And while we were not able to look at all of these papers, we actually were able to look at all of these um, because there were only 50 papers. So we were able to actually look at each and every single one of them. And we were able to determine whether or not the authors had used knowingly used um, a contaminated cell line and in that set of 50 papers, so there were about 650 that were the total set at that time um, where we knew that the authors had used an RRID. Um, and in that set, 50 of them were uh, problematic. So we looked and we only found one case where there was a knowing use of a contaminated cell line. So people did not heed that warning. The rest of them were fine. So really there was one paper out of about 650 that knowingly used a problematic cell line. Whereas this, again, we didn't look because it was too many papers, um, but you know, we know that there were lots and lots of cell lines here that were actually being used um, after the, the fact that a cell line had become completely contaminated um, was, um, uh, was uh, stated because most likely, and again, this is where, where we have to interpret, um, because most likely these authors did not look at whether or not um, the ICLAC list actually listed their cell line. So um, this is roughly, um, you know, what I have for you guys. And of course, I always talk about, um, you know, whenever I talk, I uh, ask everyone in the audience, instead of thanking my lab, which of course I should be very, very grateful for all of this work, um, but I actually turn this around almost at every time uh, to ask this, the people listening to help improve reproducibility and findability of uh, key resources, but also other things. Uh, use of RRIDs while writing your papers or reviewing is a really easy way to be able to do that. Um, so if we believe this data, then simply presenting the author with the information for a problem actually helps eliminate that problem. Um, if we believe this paper with all of its various caveats.